Daily is a media site that started in March 2012. They publish stories that often go viral. Stories they mean are worth our time and could make the world a better place. One of the founders is Eli Pariser, and he is here today to explain to us why do people share, so many people share the Upworthy stories. Welcome, Eli Pariser. When you walk through the garden. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't speak Swedish, unfortunately, and uh, I apologize in advance for some of the kind of typical American myopia and some of the examples in my presentation I'm about to give. And I'm especially bummed that I don't uh, speak Swedish because I was really interested in Amanda's um, presentation. All I got from it was, um, show don't tell, propaganda minister, and believe the dream. And on that basis, it sounds like exactly my kind of thing. So uh, I'll have to get it interpreted. But uh, my name is Eli, and uh, the driving question throughout my career has been, how do you use technology to make the world better? And I started out in online organizing, actually. I ran a group called Move On that was trying to get people engaged in civic action. And we figured out some things that then scaled and helped start some other groups like avaz.org. And after a while, I got interested in the way that media and the organizing that I was doing were interacting. And I realized that the stories that people heard had a really profound impact on what they were willing to do when it came to actually making change. And so I started looking at the way that media was changing. And uh, that led to a book called The Filter Bubble, which was about how algorithms are reshaping what we get to know. And Upworthy really emerged as a response to the filter bubble. If we live in this very social media world, you know, how do we actually make sure that people hear about the stories that really matter? That's been the driving question for me. And so I want to share with you a little bit about what I've learned in this last decade and a half. Um, and in particular, about why I believe storytelling matters. And I have to tell you, like, it's a little funny for me to be giving this speech because uh, my grandfather was a scientist, my father was a teacher. I, I'm, a, I'm really a rationalist, I'm a data guy. I'm not a big, like, woo woo storytelling person. And uh, so it's, it's odd for me to be, have become this kind of storytelling champion. But I believe, as a rationalist, that if you look at the science of what changes people's minds and what persuades them, then you have to admit that the facts are very clear, that facts are not enough. People aren't actually persuaded by facts. And what they're persuaded by is stories. And in fact, and this is the part that's all American examples, but if you look at, uh, at cultural history, you know, many of the big changes and big advances that we've made as societies have happened because of stories. Whether it was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in Manhattan that drew attention for the first time to working conditions in factories, or the jungle, Sinclair Lewis's book, that, uh, that shed a light on how food was processed. Whether it's Will and Grace, which was a sitcom that changed the way that Americans looked at gay and lesbian people or Philadelphia, which changed the way that we thought about AIDS. Or even these striking photos from the Civil Rights Movement that were the moment when that movement became something that wasn't just a concern for a few people, but became an, a, a countrywide debate. So what is it about the power of stories to change perspectives? Let's talk for a minute about the psychology of storytelling, and in particular about a, a piece of psychology called schema theory that I think explains a lot. So imagine, uh, let's start with Jack. And then there's Jill, they've got a hill, they've got a pail, maybe there's a well somewhere, and uh, you can imagine the rest of the scene. Now imagine this is the first story that you've ever heard. Everything that you know about Jill and Jack and the bucket of water comes from this story. 
So what if I tell you Jill has a weapon? You might be thinking, yeesh, like she's going to stab Jack. Or maybe throw the sword at him or something. But what if I tell you there's a monster? OK, now the story changes. And your ideas about Jill change. Now what if I tell you that Jill is going to attack a monster called the Zika virus, but she's not going to do it with a sword. She's going to do it with a new concoction she made up in a lab. What do you think about Jill now? And imagine that I told you Jill had a bucket, but she's using it to build a municipal water company in a bid to build a big bank that will eventually become JP, JP Morgan Chase. Now you see Jill very differently. And it turns out that Jill has a lot of skills. But if you've only heard that one story, the only thing you know about her is Jack and a hill and a bucket of water. So this is where schemas come in. Because schemas are basically our brain's scaffolding for taking in new information. And new stories help our brains produce new mental scaffolding. That's why stories are so powerful. And you can actually see this at work. A bunch of kids were asked to draw pictures of US presidents. And uh, here are some of the pictures. It's a little suspiciously good, I think, for kids, but whatever, we won't. Um, and you, know, you introduce this new story. And that produces a new schema. And that produces change. And I noticed this comment on one of our posts one day. Someone wrote, the other day, Cora was looking at a drawing of a person who's black, and she asked me, is that a president? That's the power of new schemas to change people's ideas about other people. So at Upworthy, you know, we tell stories to draw massive amounts of attention to the stories that really matter. And our hope is that by doing that, we can actually kind of create the empathy that allows our societies to make the world better. And the really exciting thing is that uh, this is working on a pretty massive scale. So these days, every month, we're reaching 300 million people with these stories. Now, if you're a cause marketer or you're someone who works for a nonprofit, I imagine this will be directly relevant. But I want to argue that you know, even if you have sort of more practical concerns, if you're a brand marketer, if you're someone who is in corporate, uh, corporate communications, there's something to learn here. Because it's really hard to get 300 million people to do anything. And there's something about what is working with Upworthy content that I think all of us can actually learn from. So this brings us to a question, which is, what makes a story shareable? And before I tell you the answer, I want to just give you a few clues. The first clue is, uh, this is a photo of uh, when Pope Benedict was announced back in 2005. And eight years later, here's what it looked like when Pope Francis was announced. Do you see the difference? I know you all know this, but uh, you know, mobile is such a massive change in everything about our lives. And so if you're going to be telling stories that are shareable, that make an impact, you have to think about how it works on the mobile device. Here's a second clue. You know, I think it's fair to say that the war for attention has never been greater. Each second of consumers' time is being contended over by more and more platforms at a more and more vicious rate. And there's one platform that sort of looms above them all, which is Facebook. Facebook captures more attention than all of the other social platforms combined. So if you want to tell stories that make an impact and make a world a better place, you need to think about mobile, and you need to think about Facebook. But the thing is that you know, mostly people don't tell stories this way. You know, most stories still look kind of like this. And so when my co-founder and I founded Upworthy a few years ago, the first place we looked was the headlines. And we asked, how do we actually bring a sense of you know, tangibility and uh, humor and vivaciousness to those headlines? And I think Upworthy headlines, it's safe to say, have had, you know, have been talked about a lot, maybe a little too much. And um, you know, people know that that's a part of our formula. But it's actually not the most important part. Here's our secret that people forget, which is that people don't 
our, our posts don't go viral because people click on them. They go viral because people share them. And so you have to ask, you know, not what gets people into a story, but what happens during a story that makes people want to share. As it turns out, there's a pretty good body of research on this. And it all boils down to one word, emotion. Emotion is what pe makes people share. And uh, it's worth saying, you know, it's not every emotion. There's one emotion that doesn't work, which is sadness. Sadness leaves people in this kind of gloomy, disactivated state. It literally makes them less likely to do anything, much less share a piece of content. And this was actually what we were confronting when we set out, because a lot of the stories that we wanted to tell about climate change, about economic injustice, they're kind of sad stories. So we had to find other ways in, ways that would engage people. But I think it turns out there are a lot of emotions out there. <laughs> And by using these emotions, you can actually draw people into almost any story. The Harvard Business Review did another study of emotional storytelling. And what they found was that positive emotions, you know, tend to be the emotions that are most persuasive and most shareable. But actually, you know, you can build content around negative emotions as well, as long as they contain this element of surprise. That's really a critical piece. So I think this explains uh, you know, how we've managed to reach so many people with Upworthy, because when you're talking about things that you really care about, that you're passionate about, that you believe other people need to know, you'll inherently tend to do it in an emotional register. And that resonates with a lot more people. Now, I mentioned to you all that I'm a data person. And so at Upworthy, you know, we spend a lot of time writing and creating these stories. And then we spend a lot of time measuring and analyzing them. And we've learned a lot of really interesting things about how people perceive stories. I'll share just a couple of learnings with you today. So the first is that knowledge alone doesn't motivate action. This goes back to the facts are not enough. People can know all of the things that they need to know about the Syrian refugee crisis, but if they don't feel it, if they don't feel that there is an opportunity to do something, then they're not gonna act. And so that becomes a really important piece of building a strong story. The second may be my favorite study that we've ever done. In this study, we uh, had a piece on vaccines. And uh, it was an argument that, vac that everybody should get vaccinated for you know, standard diseases. And for half of the people who came to the page, we popped up a sort of standard pop-up. You can see it over here on the left. Welcome to Upworthy. And on the other half, uh, we popped up this affirmation pop-up. You should feel good. Take a moment to think about the things that are important and meaningful in your life. You're paying attention to things that matter. So what was fascinating was those two audiences responded really differently to the content after they saw the pop-up. And the audience that had been affirmed in who they were was much more willing to change its mind about its views on vaccines. Now, we didn't just pick this out of, uh, out of a hat. Uh, this is actually a very well-regarded uh, psychological theory, which says that people tend to be much more open to new experiences when you've affirmed their identity. But it's the kind of thing that people mo normally don't think about when they're thinking about how to tell stories about difficult topics. So the last study that we did uh, was just looking at shaming, which is a common way to sell a cause or sell a product. And what we found was that stories that were based on, you know, you should feel bad, that you're not doing more, really didn't work. They deactivated people. They made them feel powerless and sad and small. And that's not what you want if you want to create a shareable story. So we've learned a lot at Upworthy, and what I want to do uh, before we go to Q&A is I kind of distill for you uh, nine of the things that we've learned in the process of doing all of this kind of data-driven storytelling work. And uh, let's jump into it. So we use technology called Elevator, which is a way of actually looking at in real time at how people are experiencing our stories. And are they staying, and are they going, and what are they doing? And we use that to actually make sure that we're telling stories that our audience genuinely appreciates and loves. And so all of these learnings are kind of drawn from our work with Elevator. 
So the first is you have to start with relatable characters. This is kind of storytelling 101, but it's amazing how many stories actually don't meet this bar. If you don't have a relatable character, you don't have something for people to hold on to. The second, and again, pretty simple stuff, but very important, is that there's something at stake. You know, you have to believe that there's some way that the character is going to uh, face a challenge, overcome an obstacle, in order for people to stick with your story. The third is authenticity. And this is incredibly important, because people are barraged right now with thousands of stories and thousands of pieces of information, and a lot of it is advertising and it's kind of manufactured uh, crap. And so the ability to actually, you know, sort of say something where you've got your heart on your sleeve and people can tell you really mean it, that's really important. The fourth is that you want to start by entertaining people and then informing them. Most people don't sign up for, you know, lectures, except for the people in this room. Uh, and, uh, you know, you need to entertain folks first. And so you have to pull them in and then engage them with, you know, the, the, the actual body of the argument. The fifth piece we found was that uh, it really actually helps the performance of a story if you address the concerns that people have on their mind as you go along. So we tested some different variations. We looked at ones where we just kind of uh, made our point, and we looked at ones where we said, now you may be thinking X, Y, or Z, and here's our thought on that. And it was actually very helpful to kind of get in that dialogue with a, with a reader that helped people stay with us. Six, people love scientific facts. This is something that we found when it's in the architecture of a story. You know, being able to say, okay, we've got you at a heart level, and now here are the facts that, that, that bolster that was really important. Seven, you want to actually sort of lead people, but not tell them where to go. So uh, when we could open up some space and say, we're just going to present an argument, what do you think? Uh, it worked a lot better than saying, here's the conclusion that you must come to. The eighth is making an easy ask of people. What can you, what can you ask people at the end of a story that actually is something that feels like they can tangibly do? Saying, you know, fly to Syria and throw your body in front of the insurgents probably isn't going to get that many uh, people to do it. But um, you can donate, you can contribute, you can sign, you can get refugees in. There are a bunch of things that you can do. And um, giving people somewhere to go, what was interesting, not only did people do it, but it actually increased people's propensity to share the story because it felt like it wasn't a hopeless thing. It felt like it wasn't a done deal. And that's the final thing, which is leaving people in a good place, which is not necessarily to say that there aren't big problems in the world, and it's not necessarily to say that we should ignore them but it's to say that when people feel empowered, when people feel in control, when people feel like there's something they can do, um, they're much more likely to engage. And so we really try to do storytelling that doesn't just depress people, but actually leaves them in a place where they say, I can help, I can be a part of this. So in closing, I wanna tell you another story. So it's September 5th, 1977, and this is the Voyager spacecraft. And it was the first spacecraft that was designed to uh, go outside of our galaxy. And it was going to collect uh, data and photos and sound from all of the nearby worlds. But then in about 10 years, the battery was going to die. And after that, Voyager had just one final mission, to be a ray of hope, to be a bottle on an intergalactic sea. And uh, a small team was pulled together that was, uh, that, was, that was asked to do this crazy thing. They were asked to create a golden record that was going to contain the human story. Andrew Yen was uh, working on that project. And here's what she told Radiolab about this kind of crazy, impossible, romantic project that they were on. It was a chance to tell something of what life on Earth was like to beings of perhaps 
a thousand million years from now. If that didn't raise goosebumps, then you'd have to be made of wood. <laughs> and here we were taking on this mythic challenge and knowing that before it was done, two spacecraft would lift off from the planet Earth, moving at an average speed of 35,000 miles an hour for the next thousand million years. And on it would be a kiss, a mother's first words to her newborn baby. Oh, come on now. Mozart. Bach. Beethoven. Greetings in the 59 most populous human languages. Shalom. Hello from the children of planet Earth. As well as one non human language, the greetings of the humpback whales. And it was a sacred undertaking because it was saying, we want to be citizens of the cosmos. We want you to know about us. So we needed to tell a story about ourselves. And the thing is that we're all part of this same story. And we are all part of this story. And the telling and retelling and shaping and reshaping of it ultimately defines not just who we are, but how we see ourselves and how we see each other. And ultimately, it defines what we're going to become. And that's why I really believe in mission-driven storytelling. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Thanks. S again, storytelling is such a powerful uh, tool. Please stay. Oh, OK. There might be some questions. Great. Yeah. Uh, didn't you used to have the tagline, things that matter, post them on? That's right, yeah. Do you still have it? I think, yes, I didn't see I think it, on it is. Yeah. yeah, no, we still believe yeah. in things that matter. Uh, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia, do you ha have any questions on Twitter, or do you have any questions? Uh, yes, we do. Um, uh, there's a person here in the audience uh, who says that storytelling, that is about subjects that are more sort of in, in line with a better society is easier to share than maybe stories about selling products. Um, and do we sort of get picky with what kinds of things we share in that way? So I, yeah. I think it starts with people share things that they're passionate about. And um, it's true that a lot of product advertising doesn't draw on people's passion. But we've worked with a lot of brands who have figured out how to integrate people's passion into the storytelling that they're doing in a way that moves their brand forward. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I think that um, you know, advertising as a medium comes from an era where you could command people's attention and you could tell them, you know, you're in front of the TV, so I'm going to speak at you for half, for half a minute. And we're moving into this different era, which is commanded much more by consum where consumers want to place their time. And so I think advertising has to evolve around that. And one of the ways that it's going to evolve is to incorporate more of a sense of purpose into the stories that it tells. Yeah, and, and the, the um, con insights you had, um, they are very, very much useful in companies. Like, for example, let people think for themselves, you know, translate it into let the customers think think for themselves. Yeah. That's really useful. I was thinking when you started in 2012, you didn't have as much competition as you have today. Is it um, harder to make people share your stories when there's so much competition? Other stories shareable? Um, well, I mean, I think we've always tried to be kind of one step ahead uh, in terms of both the format of the storytelling and the kinds of stories that we're telling. Um, and so that means, you know, as we saw Facebook, for example, moving toward video, we've shifted a lot of our resources yeah. to be a video first company. Mm -hmm. And that's helped us stay kind of at the front of the pack on the shareability of our stories overall. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I think, uh, for better or worse, and I would argue, you know, from a mission standpoint for worse, there still aren't a lot of people who are really focused on telling stories that 
um, have some kind of social message, and that's really where we uh, focus as a company. Yeah. I know that your, I, I've read that your editors make like 25 headlines on each story, and you told me that's, that they do actually make 25 headlines on each story. You that's make. right. Yeah, they do, and the reason for that really is to get past kind of your first initial idea of what the story's about. And often what we would find is on headline 19 or 21. By the way, you should try it. It's very, it's hard. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you get 10 down and you're going great and then you hit a wall somewhere in the teens and you reconceptualize how you're thinking about the story and maybe you do something wacky or something that's sort of off the wall. And that turns out to be a much better way to explain what the story's about. And so what we found was that kind of making people do that work, um, you know, you only have a split second on someone's phone to get their attention. How do you get them in with the really the most interesting version of the story? Yeah. Thank you so much, Eli. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.